present your piece. Have a care. Anywhere between 
between 30 and 100 men, and it can seem quite formidable. However, the frontage of the block is not its strength, it's actually in its depth, which we can demonstrate by taking a little slice of what it would look like down the side. Mike and Petro body by the left hand. Now you can see what it would look like in profile. It's only the first two ranks that actually do any fighting. The third and fourth ranks are in reserve, waiting to fill in holes that we caused by casualties. The rear pikeman there in the, in the red sash, he is a sergeant. He is looking at this formation and watching those front two ranks very carefully. Should he see them begin to tire, to grow fatigue, he may actually withdraw them from the combat and force the next ranks into the fight. So you're constantly rotating formation of fresh troops and to keep that, them in the fight uh, going very strong. Now, as an attacker getting into this formation, things can be, if you pardon the pun, a bit prickly. But it can be done. If I somehow get past this first man's pipe, all he can really do is hit me about the neck and shoulders rather uselessly. That's my stomach. And, if I can get, and it's the second man's job to get me. But if I somehow get past him and kill... First man, you see how the formation absorbs the casualty and can fight on. You may rise, Lazarus. Pike, they throw body by the right hand. And shoulder your pike. Now, with such a long weapon, you may think that it's quite easy to get the, uh, to use a modern expression, the drop on this formation. But actually the pikemen are quite nimble in being able to change the direction in which they're fighting. They actually have a maneuver, a posture, if you will, just for this. And it's to charge the rear of your pike. Lay on! Oh. Charge to the rear of your pike. And lay on! Oh. As you can see, they can change the direction in which they need to fight very easily because the pike block tends to be a very static formation, a very defensive formation. The reason for this is actually the second way that they engage the enemy in combat. It's the primary way that they engage the enemy in combat. And it's because they are our primary defense against armored cavalry. In order to do so, they will adopt a position of charge for horse. We're from the advanced pike position. They will place the butt of the pike upon the ground once more, bracing it with their foot. They will then crawl their side arm and lean out that pike at a proper 45 degree angle or so. From here they have a very strong defense against cavalry because that charge is going to come in and one of two things is going to happen. The first is the, uh, the armor cavalry is going to crash into this formation. Pikes and pikemen armor flying about everywhere. Don't worry about them though, I'll just hammer out the dents in the armor, put it on someone new, and we'll be right as rain for the next battle. Now, the other instance that may happen is actually the far more likely one. And this is because the horse generally is smarter than his rider. He's going to see this lovely bunch of spear points and pull up short. There's no way he's going to run into that. There's not enough carrots and oats in the world that could convince him to crash into this. So he's going to stop short, suddenly. Now that armored man on horseback has momentum working against him. He's going to go flying over those reins down into this lovely porcupine. And should he somehow survive that, there are always pesky musketeers lurking in the rear, ready to finish him off. Now in either case, something's going to happen to this weapon. It's going to break, it's going to shatter, it's going to simply be knocked from their hand. At which point the pike get their favorite command, and that is pikemen, put your pikes and follow upon the audience. Ah! Who puts the rope up? Oh. Mr. O'Neill! Right. Ladies and gentlemen, now would be a perfect time to point out that pikemen generally, though they were gentlemen, recruited for their strength of arms, not their strength of mind. Pikemen, return to your formation. Oh, but I found him! <laughs>
goes to our Musketeers. Musketeers prepare to march. And march on. Prepare to stand and stand. Face your body by the left hand. By the right hand, stop your foot. So, Musketeers. Can you think? Musketeers. Certain imagery is going to come to your mind. I'm sure it will. And with that imagery in your head, can anyone look at these fine examples and tell me what might be missing? Just shout it out. Don't overthink it. Swords, yes. Now, unlike those fancy French gentlemen you are all thinking about, or at least are thinking about now, I don't have time to teach these musketeers anything they really don't need to know about. Again, we are citizen soldiers. We're not professional soldiers, but we're not full-time soldiers. Therefore, I'm only going to teach them what they absolutely need to know. Sword is not one of those things. They will be issued one. It is as a weapon of war. They'll actually only use it as a tool, namely to hammer in ten steaks or to roast their evening meal on. And they really don't need to know about the sword, especially when I've handed all of them a lovely 10 to 12 pound club. It's also generally longer than at the average sword. So you get to be able to reach that swordsman before he could ever stick you. Speaking of this lovely club, it is the Matchlock Musket. It's what some would say is the height of firearms technology in the 16th century. It is named the Matchlock because of the piece of burning cord in each of their hands. This is slow match, cotton or hemp rope that has been soaked in salt peter. Essentially what you get when you boil down uh, animal dropping. A very lovely job, I assure you. But what these salt peters do is make this rope burn very hot and very slowly. The coal on the end of that match reaches temperatures of nearly 400 degrees. You're essentially putting fire into gunpowder. Something is bound to happen. Actually, this, uh, this uh, particular lock, this method of firing off a gun, is so effective that when introduced around the year 1450, it will continue to be in use until the year 1688, when the last matchlock is decommissioned from the English military. Indeed, even the French continue to use this weapon until the year 1704. And even, indeed, even after that, if you go to some of the more rustic households of the colonies in the New World, you may find this weapon hanging above the mantelpiece, ready to be put into action at a moment's notice. Now, there are only 21 steps in the loading and firing of this weapon. It's a very simple weapon to use, I assure you. And it's taught to them through the pages of a picture book. Why a picture book, you may ask? Well, in the 16th century, the literacy rate is not all that great. Only about one man in three knows how to read. And ladies, I apologize, but as one man in three, it's actually even worse for you poor ladies. Apparently, the men think that bad things will happen should you folks learn how to read. What? <laughs> so they look at those pictures in order to tell them how they're supposed to stand and what they're supposed to do. It's the same with our pikemen. And I can assure you that after only a couple of weeks, my stalwart pikemen here could color inside the lines and everything. So, the first step is they will handle their piece. They will then open their pan and clean out their pan, cleaning out any dirt that's been left over from the last shot. They will then handle their prime and prime their piece, pouring a small amount of very fine gunpowder in that pan that dish at the side. They will then close their pan, and because we're about to put the very hot coal of the match very close to the gunpowder, we need to make sure there isn't anywhere we don't want it. They will cast off loose corns and blow off loose corns, corns being another name for the grains of gunpowder. I'll then have them cast about their piece. This gives them access to the muzzle. Now I will have them handle their charge. And there's three of the musketeers went for the wooden bottles across their chest. This is their bandolier of charges. Each one of those wooden bottles has enough gunpowder for one shot from the musket. Now, the musketeer on the end there, she's a bit more specialized. She's what we're calling a dragoon. A dragoon is simply a musketeer that has been issued a horse. Well, really it's more like a pony. But in either case, she'll use this animal to get from one point of the battlefield to another very quickly, then dismount and fight on as a musketeer, leaving back at least one dragoon 
per, uh, per five to hold the horses. Now, as you can imagine, bouncing around in a saddle with a bandolier on could get a bit uncomfortable. Therefore, to prevent her from becoming a black-eyed Susan, we issue her a paper cartridge filled with gunpowder as opposed to the bandolier. This is actually introduced surprisingly early, about the year 1540. Now they have them charge their piece, pouring down that full measure of gunpowder. And if they're going to be loading a shot, this is when they would do it. But we are not today. If they were, they would simply pluck one from the pouch at their side, or more often, spit one out of their mouths they've been carrying around in their mouth. This may sound ridiculous considering it's a lead ball, but considering the dangers of lead poisoning aren't very well known in the 16th century, there are far more practical reasons for doing this. Namely, all of these muskets you see before you are made by hand. Each one is just a little bit different than the next. All of your musket balls would be made by hand. Each one's just a little bit different than the next. You may have to chew on your musket ball in order to get it to fit down the barrel. Which actually brings us to a requirement to join the musketeers as a tra uh, pardon me, a, the train band as a musketeer. And that is you must possess three opposing teeth, with just three. We don't shoot too high in this unit. So now I have them draw forth their scouring stick and ram home their charge, seating everything good and tight down at the bottom. They will then recover their scouring stick and replace it, which is the most important step. Don't get me wrong, you can fire your scouring stick and makes an excellent projectile. However, it's a rather awkward weapon. The awkward part being having to go across the battlefield and ask for it back. We don't want any shish kebabs, so we make sure we put it back. Now I have them recover their piece, take forth their match and blow it well, it says in the manual of arms. If they get any ash off the end of that coal and make sure it's good and hot, you may actually see it glow orange there for a moment. I'll then have them cock and try their match, placing it in the jaws of the serpentine and working the action to ensure it's going to hit the proper place on the pad. It is at this point that they are ready to fire, so I'll turn them in a safe direction Musketeers, well, your bodies about the center by the left hand. And pace yourself six paces to the rear. I'll then call them to present your piece. Have a care! Give fire! Now, good musketeers are expected to be able to perform all those actions three times in a minute. Now obviously they can't do that while being in each and every little step of the drill by myself. That's where my job gets very simple. All I need to say is, musketeers, make ready your piece. They will now do so as quickly as they can. You can imagine that this is how it would be on the battlefield. These musketeers are going to no longer be doing this drill for the practice of it, as any good soldier will do. He will take what he has learned in drill and begin to adapt it for himself. You may actually be seeing musketeers skip steps as they go through their drill. Well, that was very fast. Present your piece and give fire. Now, one more thing you may have noticed. In addition to that 20 seconds per shot, in addition to those 21 steps, musketeers are expected to be able to reload whilst on the move. You may have noticed the butt of the weapon never touching the ground. The reason that they need to be able to do this has been standing right here the entire show, the armored pikemen. The musketeers are actually marching along the battlefield shoulder to shoulder with these men. Just as it's the pikemen's job to protect the musketeers from getting run over by cavalry, it's the musketeers' job to make sure that the pikemen gets into hand-to-hand -hand combat without too many bullet holes. But in order to do that, they perform a maneuver called fire by advance. Me, you imagine a few sir. more ranks of musketeers here. The rear rank will be called to the front. They will meet, or if they will fire their weapons in a volley like we've been showing you, they immediately begin to reload. The new rear rank will come forward and do the same. The effect you have is that you are leapfrogging rank by rank towards the enemy with the pike keeping up as you advance. We'll show you how this works in miniature. Musketeers, by the left hand, double your right. Rearing, advance to the floor. Present your piece and give fire. Rearing, advance to the 
four. Present your feet and give fire. Now, misfires were not very common with a match lock. Usually it came down to operator error. That he placed the match in the wrong place yeah. in the serpentine. Fire. Usually just a little adjustment and it'll go right off. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the match lock musketeer. Please show them some appreciation. The final thing we're going to show you today is how this company would operate as one cohesive unit. And the way we're going to do this is to demonstrate what would happen if they came under attack from cavalry. So I want you to all put your imaginations on and imagine a thundering horde of armored horsemen coming up over this hill. This unit is going to defend itself. What's going to happen is the fighters are going to rush forward, forming that charge for horse line, putting themselves in harm's way. Come up behind them, discharge their weapons in successive volleys in an effort to break up that charge before it ever hits. Don't worry about the musketeers, they're pretty smart. If it looks like it's not going to work, they'll be several yards down range while those pikemen get run over. So they'll get away fighting those heads. Company, face your bodies by the left hand. By the left hand, double your fire. Company, salute. demonstration at 3 of the clock and again at 5 and 30 we will actually be upon Bosworth Field demonstrating our lovely artillery piece there in the corner. Now as soon as the matches of the musketeers are out I will consider the weapons safe and invite you to come forward take a closer look at our equipment and ask any questions you may have. However I will leave you with this one final warning. My pikemen are trained but they are not tamed. Please do not attempt to feed them or make any sudden movement. They do startle quite easily. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen.